morning, church. It's another lovely Sunday morning, and we're here to worship and praise God all together, and just to be in God's presence and to be in each other's presence, too. So if you can join us, we're all going to worship together. So if you're able to stand, please stand. Um, we're going to play a couple songs and just praise God together.
leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to. identity in you and that's when we acknowledge you and we seek you with everything God we sing these songs just for how good you are and just because we just love you so much God I just want to pray for this message today and that everyone here will be open and will really seek you through it just name it
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to everyone. I'm so glad you're here. Welcome to those joining us online as well. Well, three years ago, I had cancer. Some of you uh, were here at that time, and um, I'm doing well. The cancer's all gone, but I've been thinking back to that time, and um, I had never had surgery before, and in that experience, I I got to know all these different medical professionals, this amazing team that was working together so that I could be healed and that I could thrive and live. And so there were two surgeons, one to remove the cancer and another then to come in after that. And there was the anesthesiologist and he assured me he would be there the whole time just making sure that the anesthesia was working, which I very much appreciated. There was the nurse who got the IV started and uh, you know she played this critical role too in everything that happened. And then after the surgery, there were the nurses, the doctors, the aides, and each of them had this important critical role that they were playing in taking care of me and helping me to heal. And when I went home, then there was, there, there was many of you who brought food and sent me cards and stayed overnight at my home. And you were working together for my healing. And it was amazing. And, and I felt like I had this whole big team of people working together and contributing their gifts and their hearts just so that I could heal. And, and the people on this team didn't all know each other, but they were all working together beautifully for, for the good of me, for me to be able to heal. Well, I want to welcome you to our ongoing sermon series called This is Church. We're studying 1 Corinthians chapters 12 and 13, and, and we're looking at what the church is and how we all are called to live and, and work and serve together, kind of like that amazing team that came around me to help me to be able to, to thrive and heal. Last Sunday, Pastor Toby shared about some of the spiritual gifts that God gives us. He shared from the scripture about things like a message of wisdom, a message of knowledge, a a gift of healing, faith, discerning of spirits, and all these different gifts that God gives to Christians to be able to serve God and to serve people. And In the the church that Paul wrote to, this church in Corinth, they were struggling with how to use those different gifts. They're called to use those gifts for the common good, but they were struggling to know that, that they should be using these gifts in a way that serves others and that isn't just serving ourselves. And so some people in the Corinthian church were uh, like prideful, feeling like God had given them the best gifts and that their gifts were more important than others. And then there were other people in the Corinthian church who probably felt like, like, oh, like I have nothing to offer. Like the other people have important gifts and, and what can I offer? And so, and so Paul who was this amazing Christian who persecuted Christians and then became a Christian himself, he wrote to the church in Corinth to help them do better in using the gifts that God has given them to use those gifts for the common good. And I wonder for us, do we tend to fall into one of those two camps? Like, maybe feeling prideful, like, oh, God has given me this, this amazing gift, and it's better than others. But, but honestly, I think that maybe what a lot of us might feel is, like, who am I? Like, I don't have important gifts. What can I offer? And again, Paul is writing to us to say that God has given each of us gifts 
and each gift is needed and important and valued, and each gift contributes to the common good so that people can thrive and be healed and know God. The network of churches that this church is part of is called the PCJC. We're part of the Free Methodist denomination. And the PCJC has a prayer alliance, and it's a team of people from various different PCJC churches who pray together, and I'm part of that team. And when we were putting this team together, we met with each person who wanted to serve on this team. And we wanted to learn about the gifts God has given them so that when we pray together as a team, we can use our gifts and and we can really uh, be a help to the person that we're praying for. And you might wonder, like, what would that look like to use gifts, like, in a prayer session? So I wanted to describe this to you just to give a picture of, like, this is what it can look like when a team of people use their gifts that God has given them. So imagine that there's a group of three or four of you, and you're praying in depth for someone. And maybe the person you're praying for has been struggling with, like, hopelessness and despair. And so maybe one member of the prayer team senses, like, I think God wants to speak hope to this person. And so that person, that prayer team member, speaks it forth. They, they speak hope into that person's life. And then maybe another prayer team member feels like there's a scripture that God's highlighting. And so they share that scripture with the person. And, and the person says, you know, that is a scripture that is so meaningful to me. That speaks into what I'm experiencing right now. Maybe another prayer team member senses that maybe there's also physical pain along with the, the emotional pain. And so, so they, they ask, like, are you, are you possibly feeling like physical pain? And, and the person maybe says, yes, I am. And so, so now the prayer team prays and, and prays for that, that pain to go away in Jesus' name. And, and maybe the person experiences release and relief and begins to experience healing. And so as a team, the prayer team members are using the gifts that God has given them. And they're using these gifts for the good of, of that person with, that they're praying for. And they're using their gifts to the glory of God. And it's a beautiful thing. And I pray that in the days ahead, that we as a church will more and more learn what the gifts are that God has given us and then learn how to, how to work together and serve together and, and use our gifts in beautiful ways for the common good, beautiful ways to serve people and to glorify God. You know, it's the Holy Spirit that distributes these gifts to each person, and the Holy Spirit determines, like, I'm going to give this person this gift. I'm going to give this person this gift, and no one is left out. These gifts are beautifully distributed, and these gifts are so needed as we worship and we serve together. And to help us to learn more and more what this means, what all of this means about spiritual gifts, the Apostle Paul has written uh, the letter of First Corinthians, and we'll turn to the scripture at First Corinthians 12, verse 12. Let's see what Paul says. Just as the body, though one, has many parts, but all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. This is an amazing illustration, and it's more than just any old illustration. You know, I, I've used illustrations like the church is a little bit like in a, a sports team with an amazing coach where we're all working together to play our best. Or the, or the church is like an orchestra with an amazing conductor, and we're all playing together to, with the, this beautiful sound. But honestly, this picture, the picture that Paul is presenting of the body, is different from all those other pictures. It's a, a whole different level of truth because it's describing the church as the body of Christ. 
And it's a profound thing to think about. Paul says that the body is made up of many parts, and, and there's diversity in, in all those different parts, and, and somehow the unity is made even more deep and profound because of the diversity of all those parts. You know, the human body is, is one whole. We can't, we can't divide a human body into multiple people. It's one body, and, and if a part gets cut off, that part dies, and, and the body suffers, and, and every part is so, so needed and so beautifully put together, and, and all the parts together form the body that can thrive and, and can flourish. And Paul is saying it is similar with the body of Christ. You know, when Jesus was here on earth, incarnate, fully God, fully man, in a physical body, he, he was here. And now Jesus is here in such a very profound, real way, as in the body of Christ, the church. Back when Paul was a persecutor of Christians, he had this experience we call his Damascus Road conversion experience, where Paul hears this voice of God saying to him, why are you persecuting me? And Paul, um, he, he went by the name Saul at that point. He, he, asked, he asked, Lord, who are you? <laughs> and and the, the, the voice of God says, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. And it's interesting because Paul just thought he was persecuting Christians. But Jesus says, no, it, you're, you're persecuting me. When you persecute Christians, you're persecuting me. And that's because the Christians together form the body of Christ. And we're able to be his body because we're created in his image. I want to look at how Genesis 1.27 says this. This is in the, the very first chapter of the Bible. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. It's powerful because, because the scripture says that God said, let there be light and there was light. God said, let there be water, and there was water. God said, let the land produce vegetation, and there was vegetation. And then God said, let the land produce living creatures, and, and there were living creatures. But then God changes the word that he uses, and he says, let us make mankind in our image. It's the trinity of God saying, let us make mankind in our image. We human beings are different from every other work of God. We're created in his image. And that's such an amazing thing. And, and it's, it's the mercy of God that we would be created in his image. Two chapters later in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve fall into sin. They, they distrust God and that they distrust that what God has told them is good and true. And so they fall into sin and they become the representatives of, of our fallen humanity. And then Jesus comes thousands of years later, fully God and fully man. And one of the ways that scripture refers to Jesus is as the second Adam. And Jesus is bringing redemption to humanity. And so when Paul calls us the body of Christ, he's using this image to express what we as the church, with the redemption of Jesus, have become. That we have become the body of Christ. It's an amazing thing. Let's continue with Paul's words to us in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, 
and we were all given the one spirit to drink. There's a lot of all in that verse, isn't there? There's, there's no partial Christians, no Christians left out. We are all part of this body of Christ. And there's no, like, secret membership process for how you become part of the body of Christ. The confession, Jesus is Lord, and then living that out is what it means to be a Christian and then to be part of the body of Christ. In Paul's mind, baptism by the Spirit and baptism in water are are linked together because in Paul's day, most Christians were baptized right away when they came to believe, like very shortly after they came to believe. And so wording of baptism is really speaking of this new life that, that Christians have when they've come to be part of the body of Christ. I want to share a beautiful story from scripture of what this beginning of the Christian life can look like. I want to share the story of Cornelius and his family. Maybe you've heard it before. So Cornelius was this God-fearing man. He was seeking God, but he, he wasn't a Christian. He wasn't Jewish. He was, he was just a man seeking God. And one day, he had this experience of God where God told him, go, there's this man called Peter. Have, have, your, have your people find Peter and, and send for Peter to come back to share with you about God. And meanwhile, Peter, this Jewish Christian disciple of Jesus who had walked with Jesus, is at his home And he has an experience with God. And in his experience, this sheet comes down. He sees this sheet come down. And on this sheet, there are all these impure animals that that Jewish people were not supposed to eat, according to the purity laws. And, And so Peter sees this strange thing, this sheet with impure animals on it. And God speaks to Peter and says, Peter, get up and kill and eat these animals. And Peter is really startled, and he says, Lord, I've never eaten impure or unclean animals. Like, how, like, what, what are you asking me to do? And, and God says to Peter, don't call anything unclean or impure that I have made clean. And so Peter is puzzling about this, just asking God, like, what does that mean? What are you, what is it that you're saying to me? And right at that moment, the the men who have gone from Cornelius's home, they arrive at Peter's home, and they ask, like, is Peter here? And and they explain, like, um, Cornelius wants you to come to his house and and share with him. (laughs) And because of what God has just done in Peter's life, Peter agrees. And so Peter welcomes the men from Cornelius to, to stay overnight at his guests, as his guests. This is breaking down all these barriers between Jewish and non-Jewish people. And, and, and then the next day, they head back to Cornelius' home. And when they get to the home of Cornelius, it's not just his immediate family there. It's like his, his whole household, his whole extended family and friends. And they're all there at the home of Cornelius. And Cornelius tells Peter, like, we're all here in the presence of God to listen to everything that God has told you to tell us. And at that moment, Peter begins to realize that this body of Christ is going to be much wider and more diverse than he ever realized before. And so Peter begins to preach to Cornelius and all the people there and to tell them about Jesus. And while Peter is preaching, the Holy Spirit falls on them. And Peter is astonished. And again, he's seeing like, wow, it's really true that God is accepting people from everywhere who will come to believe in him. 
And then Peter says, the Holy Spirit has come on them. There's, there, who could keep them from being baptized? And so Cornelius and his household get baptized. And they ask Peter to stay with them, and he stays for a few days to help them get started with this new life that they have as followers of Jesus. It's a really remarkable story. It's beautiful. And it shows how amazing and unusual this body of Christ is that God has put us into. And the next time that Peter goes up to kind of the, the headquarters of the early church, he goes to Jerusalem, and, and word has gotten out that Peter, this Jewish Christian, had gone to the home of Cornelius, this God-fearing, non-Jewish person, and, and some of the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem start criticizing Peter and just wondering, like, how could you do that? How could you go into this impure place? And so Peter tells the whole story, the story I just told you about everything that happened and how God led him to go to the home of Cornelius. And when the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem hear this testimony, they begin to catch a vision for what God is doing. And they begin to praise God and say, so this is amazing, even to the, the non-Jewish Gentiles, God is granting repentance that leads to life. Everyone who gives their life to Christ is included in the body of Christ. Nobody gets left out, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free, as Paul says. This body of Christ is for all who believe in Jesus. We see barriers being broken down here, and I love that. We, we all share that same water of baptism. We share the same Holy Spirit. We share the same promise of God. And we share this newness of life, of being, being Christians, being followers of Jesus, being members of his body. And I wonder today what some of those barriers and divisions are in our society today, in our world today, God can take down those barriers even today so that we can more fully know this beautiful body of Christ that we are a part of. I want to look at Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 28. Paul speaks into the same theme there. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And these verses are not saying that we lose who we are. These verses are saying that the barriers that can sometimes be up between us that those barriers are coming down, that there's nothing that will keep us all who believe in Jesus from being together in this united body of Christ. These verses share a beautiful picture of baptism as being clothed in Christ. It's like the person being baptized puts off their old clothing that was like their old way of life, and they're immersed in the water of baptism. And then they, they rise back up out of the water of baptism and they put on this new clothing. They clothe themselves in Christ for this new life that they are living as his followers. And if the Apostle Paul were to be asked when it was that he became part of the body of Christ, I think he would say in that Damascus Road experience when his life was changed, that was when he became part of the body of Christ. And then a few days after that, he was baptized in water, representing and as a sign and a seal of this changed life that he had experienced. My own baptism took a little bit longer. I, I've shared with you that I became a Christian in October of my senior year of college. And... Um, 
there was a, a Christian campus ministry that, that I had been attending their meetings, and many of my good friends were part of this ministry, and, um, and they had welcomed me in. So that October, I had become a Christian, and then that next May, at the end of the school year, um, at a camp at Catalina Island, that was when I was baptized, and um, it was a sign and a seal of what God had already been doing in my heart. And, you know, I didn't grow up in the church. I never went to children's Sunday school never had a youth group experience, never went to vacation Bible school, never went to, to Christian camp till I was in college. And I thank God that he brings into the body of Christ, even someone like me who grew up with no Christian influence. He welcomes all of us who have faith in Jesus into this body of Christ. Well, let's continue with Paul's words to us in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 14. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. So the body of Christ, you all, the church, is where we get to learn how to serve together and worship God together and use the gifts that he has given us and, and to do all of this for the common good, to serve God, to serve people, for the healing of people, and that people can thrive in relationship with God. And I think that the diversity of the body of Christ keeps us asking God, what is your will? And keeps us seeking God because we all, we all come with different perspectives and together we get to learn what the will of God is for our church and for our lives. I want to share, this is sort of a, a ridiculous story and I don't know if it's true or if it's just kind of like a speaker's story, but here it is, it has a point to it. So there is this story of a family that every time they would cook a ham, they would cut off the two ends of the ham and put it down in the pan and put it into the oven. And that's just what they would do every time. Like, here's the ham, we'll cut off the ends, put it on the pan, put it in the oven. And at some point, someone in the family asked, why? <laughs> why do we do this? Why do we cut off the ends of the ham? And it turned out, no one knew. They, they didn't know why they cut off the ends of the ham, like if somehow that made it cook better or something. But, but the wife knew that her mom had always cut off the ends of the ham. So she reaches out to her mom and, and asks, like, I feel silly asking this, but, but why do we cut off the ends of the ham? And then the mom said, Oh, <laughs> that's because when you were growing up, the pan that I used like, was small and, and the ham couldn't fit. And so we cut off the ends so it would fit in the pan. It's a silly story, but I think that the diversity that God has put in us keeps us from falling into complacency and just continuing to cut off the ends of the ham when maybe there's something different that God is inviting us to do. Several of us on staff are working through a curriculum on stewardship. I, you know, I shared last week a little bit about the Rizo Sea Coffee House that we're working on developing. And so we're going through this study that will help us put language to the vision for the coffee house and then be able to invite people to be part of it and to contribute towards it and, and just to, to be involved in it. And as we're going through this curriculum, we're reading about the, the faith convictions of some famous Christians. And so one person we read about is George Mueller. You might have heard of him before. He lived in the 1800s in England, and he led an orphanage for children. And um, his faith conviction was that he would never ask for money, that instead, when there was a need, he would pray, and he would trust that God would answer. And so the story goes that 
there came a night when there was no milk for the children's breakfast the next day. And so he and his wife, um, like they didn't have the money to buy the milk. And so they prayed and asked that God would provide. And God did. And the provision came, and the children were able to have milk that next morning. But then, in this curriculum, the very next story we read is the story of D.L. Moody. He lived in the U.S. in the 1800s. And his faith conviction was that he was constantly asking people to contribute financially towards the ministry. And for him, he felt like that was how he lived an active faith, that, that his faith led him to invite everybody to be a part of what God was doing. It's two completely different ways of living out your faith regard to stewardship, and they're both faithful, but it's so diverse, and both are part of the body of Christ, and I love that. Right here in our church, we have diverse stories. Each of you has a story of how you became a Christian, and each of you has a story of what the life of faith looks like in your own life. And I want to share that um, on May 5th, we're going to have a, a testimony time after church. So Sunday, May 5th at, at 1230 after our service, we'll be in the fellowship room for this testimony time. And, and two of our very own Rise OC people will be sharing their testimonies that day. And Nori will be sharing and Andrew will be sharing. And it'll be wonderful to get to hear what God has done and what God has put into each of them. And I hope that over the days and months ahead that we can hear many testimonies of, of how we each came to faith and what God is doing in our lives, and what that faith life looks like for us. So in this season of replant, you know, we're, we're seeking God with this vision to raise up the next generation, and to be a blessing to the community, and to serve Japanese families. In this season of replant, Let's be always seeking God for what he is doing here in this place and what it looks like for each of us with our different gifts to serve him and to, to work together for the common good and to see the love of God uh, go forth in, in this city and in this region. Later in, the, in this chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, Paul will say these words, now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is part of it. And my prayer for us is that we will learn more and more what that means, that we'll treasure one another's gifts, that we'll joyfully serve together and, and combine all our different gifts beautifully to, to just be a place where people can come and, and learn about God and follow him and have that joy of being part of the body of Christ. Let me pray for us as we close today's message. Thank you, God. You have made us so beautifully. We are so diverse with different gifts and just different heart expressions of our worship of you and our love for you. And God, that diversity makes us even more united because we get to serve together for the common good. God, I lift up all of us here today, all of us watching online. I thank you for each person. And God, I pray for anyone who might feel like they don't know their gifts. They don't know their place. I pray your encouragement. You have, you have put beautiful, wonderful, powerful gifts in each person. And truly, in the days and weeks ahead, may we together learn our own gifts. May we learn one another's gifts. May we joyfully work together and, and steward all that you have given us 
that it may be for your glory and for the, the healing and saving of people. Thank you, God, for your love. Thank you for this life in you. We love you and we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's continue together in worship. You can join us in standing. So how's 
thank you, God. Thank you, God, for your goodness. Thank you, God, for each person I see here. You've created each person so beautifully. Thank you, God, for your presence in our lives, for your mercy, for your grace, for the hope and joy that we have in you. And God, I pray for each person here, each person watching online, as we head into this new week, it is a week filled with promise. It's filled with your promises. And I pray, may we, may we enter this week with joy and, and thanksgiving and knowing that you will be with us all the way through our week. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. We love you, God. We worship you today. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, you can be seated, everyone. So, so this is our time to respond to what God's doing this morning, what God's doing here in our church, what God's doing in our own hearts. And in a moment, I'll invite us into our, our time of giving for today. You know, when we give, we're, we're recognizing God has given to us everything that we have, and we get to give back to him from a portion of what he has given us. And then, as the church, we get to use those funds for God's love to go forth, for the ministry of this church to go forth. And, and I want to share with you a little bit today about what, what we see God doing here at Rise of Sea. Last week, I shared about the coffee house, and today I want to share about our youth leaders and our youth ministry. We see God stirring up a heart for worship and prayer among our youth leaders, and it is exciting. This past Thursday night, the, the youth leaders and Keiko and myself went to a, a, a college worship and prayer night, and there were uh, a few hundred college students there spending their Thursday night in worship and prayer and discipleship of God. And, and, and we really sense, and the youth leaders really sense that God is inviting the youth, but, but also those of us of all ages, more deeply into a worship and prayer, that this church would be a place that would have a culture of worship and prayer. And I'm so excited to see what's going to develop as we all seek God together and, and enter in more and more to prayer and worship together. So as we give, that's part of what we're giving towards. We're giving towards the ministry and the things that we see God doing here. There's online giving available. There's a giving box in, in the back of the sanctuary near the sound booth. And I want to invite you, whether you give today or you give sometime in the future, when you give, let it be a moment of worship and prayer. And if you would, lift up to God the, the youth and the, the youth leaders and this culture of prayer and worship that God is developing here. And, and I pray, God, would you do that in us? We, we say yes to what you are doing here, God. Let this be a, a house of prayer and worship where we seek you with everything that's in us, where we, we wholeheartedly give ourselves to you. Thank you, God, for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're doing in the youth. Thank you for what you're doing in the youth leaders. Thank you and for what you are doing in the young adults and the children and the people of all ages. God, we say yes to you. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this time, I want to invite Mika. She's going to come and close out the service with a few announcements. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mika. 
uh, and I'll be doing today's announcements. Uh, so there's also a QR code um, in front of you uh, in like the seat pocket if you guys would like to scan and follow along as I do announcements today. Uh, so first off, yesterday we had our youth skating night. So we usually have our youth group on the third Saturdays of every month. So uh, this is after we had dinner. So thank you, Jeff, for cooking us smash burgers. It was so fire. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So <laughs> um, and this is us uh, skating. Uh, it was a lot of fun. A lot of people were falling down and it was kind of a struggle, but it was really fun. So yeah. Um, if you know any youth, I uh, please personally invite them to our youth group. I, um, it is coming up next month sometime on the third Saturday of, yeah, next month. So yeah, please feel free to invite any youth that you know. It's such a wonderful time of fellowship. Um, and there is free food provided each time. So, all right, next we have Lot's Ministry that is happening on Saturday, May 4th uh, from 7.30 to 10 a.m. So if you, would, or if you are interested in serving, please uh, sign up on the Google form or talk to Pastor Jenny. And next, we have our testimony and fellowship time uh, next Sunday, or no, no, sorry, Sunday, May 5th uh, at 1230. So there is a light lunch that is provided, and it's going to be in the fellowship room. So I encourage all of you guys to highly go and to listen to testimonies. Yeah. Um, and next up, we have our prayer team available. Uh, Mary Jo in the back, she is raising her hand. So if you would like to receive any prayer or would like to pray with her, she is available after the service. Uh, so thank you, Pastor Jenny, for today's message. Um, yeah, I hope you guys have a wonderful week. and Thank you for joining uh, today's service. Thank you.